several other announcements here. And that is, um, today also, this is a full day. We have not only our service here this morning with Dr. Fiditas, but we also have, uh, in the afternoon, a fellowship lunch right outside. So how many of you have stomachs? <laughs> how many of you have mouths? And how many of you ever get hungry? Well, that sounds like something you might be interested in. Following that fellowship meal, we also have a uh, baptism. We had a baptism actually this morning, a wonderful baptism, with eight people who dedicated or rededicated their lives. And so we've heated up Moses Rock for you. It was kind of cold this morning, but we heated it up so that you will not have to deal with 60 degrees. It'll now be 62. So, uh, uh, so it was a great blessing this morning, and we're looking forward to those who are being baptized both from New Start and also in joining our church family. And so we're looking forward to that and also a couple rebaptisms today at 3.30. Not only that, we have after that, that baptism at 5 o'clock, we have our spring concert. It's kind of our resurrection concert, a resurrection theme. And uh, Erwin Anasi, our minister of music and and conductor at the college will be leading his group. And how many of you want to come to that? How many would like to come to that two times? <laughs> well, you should only come once. But there are two exact, they're exactly the same, two concerts that are exactly the same. One is today at 5 o'clock, and one is tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Two concerts exactly the same. How many think that's just great? Exactly the same. So uh, please pick one of those, and we want to see you there, and uh, we'll be rejoicing together. I'm going to have a special message about the resurrection. If you know what it says, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is empty. Or like it says in the ENISB, vain. Or another translation, null and void. Or in the NIV, useless. So we'll talk about that rumor of resurrection as a part of that concert this afternoon. But right now, I'd like to call forward um, our own dear Oleg and Karen and their, their newborn Ian. And we have a special dedication today. How many of you have actually come because of this dedication today? You're a special guest. Nobody? I thought I saw some people that were here were actually guests. Did you invite some people to come to this special day? You did. All right. Do you want to acknowledge your guests? Where are they? They're in the fourth row, I think, fourth, fifth row. All right. Good. Well, we, we're, we're glad that you came to join us. And uh, come right over here in the middle so we can have the spotlights on the baby and wake him up. No, there he is. He's <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> he's cuter than, he's just so cute. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he's actually cuter than this, this good for him. He's going to be having a, a lot of problems, people following him around. <laughs> so, um, you know, as I was thinking about dedication today, and just to say a couple words before this special prayer, um, I was reminded of the... Um, wonderful joy that my wife and I have had in raising a number of children. Like my wife says, I say I have four children, and she says he has five. She includes me along with the children. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, marriage is a blessing from the Lord, and the, the fruit of the loom is his reward. And we see that you have been greatly rewarded here. He even came with a bow tie. <laughs> and when was he born? He was born in Roseville. Okay, he was born in Roseville. What was his, what's his birthday? When? Yeah. In August 17. August 17. Wow. He's looking at me like I'm someone from the planet Zolar. <laughs> I want to share just one text with each of you as parents on this time of dedication. Um, first of all, for dad. Uh, being a father is an awesome privilege and an awesome responsibility. 
And I know that you carry this well because I've seen you in, in the role of father, not only in your own family, but also as the men's dean. And this text is for you, Oleg. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So this is our challenge as fathers to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Of course, it starts right this age and spending time with your little boy and bringing him up in that nurture. And then don't provoke your children to wrath. Now, I've been known to do that. I've talked to my kids at times, and they get upset at me. They're, they're upset. And so I just, I, I just give you a, pe a, a, a tip, maybe, not that I'm ready to write a seminar, right, dear? Correct. <laughs> so, see, we're always agreeable. And, that, and that, <laughs> that is, you know, if it seems a little tense, just spend some time with, with your, your children and ask them this simple question. Is there anything that I said I was going to do that I did not do? And then just take out your pen and write those six pages out. And then start working on that. So just a little tip for you on that. Now, Mom, a text for you before our prayer for Ian. And Timothy has an interesting text. It says that the woman shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith and charity with holiness and with sobriety. So, of course, this is for those who are married that are involved in the childbearing, ideally. And as they continue in the faith, they, uh, they will actually, it has a part of not only the child's salvation, but their salvation. And you think about that, you're going to learn many great lessons from Ian. You know, this is true. And it's going to help you in your walk with the Lord as well. But what an important work you have. I was reading from a book called Adventist Home. And listen to this. This is for you, Karen. The king upon his throne has no higher work than has the mother. An angel could not ask for a higher mission. So you have a higher work than the king on his throne. This is the king on his throne, but you're higher than him in this sense. An angel could not ask for a higher mission. Let her only realize the high character of her task, and it will inspire her with courage that say may resist the temptation to conform to the world's standard. Her work is for time and eternity. And the mother is God's agent to Christianize her family. How many think these are high callings? It's really a dedication of the parents, not the child. Amen? We call it a child dedication because he's cute, and that's how we get up here and we get to talk. So let's just have that prayer. We have a special plant here that you can plant to maybe remember this day. It smells good. And there's also a special text for Ian in here that can maybe be one of his life texts. So let's pray together. And should I hold this little guy or should you? Maybe I'll just touch him and then it's up to you. I called him. Okay. Okay, let's pray. Let's kneel together and pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for Karen and Oleg and for their wonderful family and for this new addition of the family, um, Ian, who's actually trying to use the microphone already as a, maybe a preacher of your word. And we just every, ask every blessing on Karen and Oleg, and may you bless them and bless Ian through them. And may you, in a special way, be in Ian's life. May your Holy Spirit uh, come upon his life in a powerful way. May angels surround him. I believe he's God's man. You want to use him. And so as Karen and Oleg raise him, as he cries out to you and to them, may they all grow closer to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Oh, by the way, Oleg and Karen are rededicating their life in... Baptism this afternoon at 3.30 is a part of the candidates, so we look forward to that as well. God bless you. Well, let's stand together. Our anthem of praise, our choristers coming up. Jesus paid it all, all to him.
just pray. Father in heaven, today we dedicate this service to you. We ask that your presence would be in this house. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. One of the great blessings of worship is not only receiving, but giving. And as a matter of fact, the scriptures indicate that you really not, have not had a worship service unless you have an offering. And so, uh, because you can't just, how many of you have noticed that you, if you breathe in, you also need to breathe out? If you've not figured that out yet, you don't have long to live. So, once we receive, we we also must give, uh, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, so also ye walk ye in him. So when you receive, then you begin to give back. All things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee, says the scriptures. So it's now time for our offering. Our offering today will go for the local church budget to support various ministries and missions of the church. One of the ministries and missions of the church and school is actually our choir, um, and actually the college choir. And this afternoon, we're going to have a special program with them. And the church is going to be donating some funds to them as they go on their tour in Europe to expand the ministry of the church. And so this afternoon, you may have an, op an opportunity to give more to that choir cause, but also as you give to the church budget, you'll be supporting that today. So we'd ask the uh, usher, ushers and deacons to come forward to receive this morning's offering. And let's just bow our heads and ask the Lord to bless this offering. Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful that uh, you've given us so much. And certainly you are worthy, which means we want to worship you. And we worship you now in returning our tithes and offerings. We dedicate them to your cause. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Now it's time for prayer. The words of that song were once to every man and nation. Comes a moment to decide. And as we've heard messages about forgiveness, about children, the next one is going to be about how to gain the victory. Let's pray. Please bow your heads. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the joy that every person here brings. I want to thank you for your deliverance that you give. Today, if there's anything that comes between us and you, I pray that you would forgive us, cleanse our hearts, make us like you. Thank you that we are your children and that when we call upon you, we will be saved. Help us to have that trust and that reliance upon you. In Christ's name, amen. My pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, taking the pulpit today. And uh, before he speaks, we're going to have a special number. Uh, but I just want to say a word about uh, Dr. Fiditas. He's been a great blessing to me personally, working with him over the past several months. And as the people that I've invited to the meetings night by night have come, I, I've not been able to be at each of the meetings because I'm working with one of the programs here. But I'm just getting wonderful reports from what God is doing through your messages. My wife is giving me a report each night, and I'm looking forward to uh, listening again today. Dr. Fiditas teaches here in our religion and theology department. He teaches Hebrew and Greek and missions, and he teaches evangelism. He's done much evangelism in, in Africa and also in the Philippines. And he has a wonderful family as well, Jacqueline and the boys here. And we're just delighted that you're a part of our family, and we look forward to hearing you after the special number this morning.
Ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I'm excited. Thank you, Pastor Don, for the introduction. He's not there. He's joining someone. Uh, I want to thank the Lord for this opportunity that I have to be able to speak to such a large congregation. This is probably the largest ever since I'm here. Oh no, there was the Christmas concert. That was a great one. But this is probably the second largest congregation ever since I'm on this uh, campus. And I want to praise the Lord for this. I believe, as I said before, that actually every time I stand before people, because I know I don't deserve, and there could be so many other possibilities for somebody else to stand and speak. So if God allows me to speak and he allows you to be there, there is no coincidence. It's because God has a plan for you and for me. And so uh, uh, yesterday evening, for those of you who were there, we had a very interesting topic, but it was quite a big cake, right? And uh, uh, not so easy when it is too big. You, you just want to eat a little and uh, uh, you may need to continue with your research. It's going to be very interesting. And this morning I have a very important topic again. It is the secret to final victory. And I want to inform you, to tell you, that actually you too can be victorious. Shall we bow our heads as I kneel down to pray? Heavenly Father, into your hands I commit myself. I know I can't say a word that is going to touch anyone's heart in this congregation without you. So I pray, Father, that you will hide me behind your cross and you will bless the words that I'm going to speak on your behalf so that you and my friends, everyone who is here as we walk out of this room, we will say that indeed the Lord has been with us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We can open our Bibles or you can follow from the screen. We have an interesting uh, passage and we're going to uh, be just dealing with this. We ha we'll have some other scriptures. But this Hebrews, if you want, you open your Bible and you, re you remain there. It is going to be very interesting. Hebrews 11 from verse 13 to verse 16. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Verse 14, people who say such things show that they, were, they are looking for a country of their own. And verse 15 says, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Can you say amen? amen. If you can. God bless you. Thank you. There are a lot of amens here. Uh, this is the book of Hebrew, right? Uh, the letter to the Apostle Paul to Hebrew. Now, there are some critics who will say, no, it is not the, uh, written by uh, Paul. And uh, we're not going to argue about that. But they will say, well, there are some elements we don't see which are common to the uh, epistles written by the Apostle Paul. And one of the arguments they say, well, you don't have the three sisters of the Apostle Paul. And one of, knows who are the three sisters of the Apostle Paul? You probably don't. But the sisters of the Apostle Paul are not the natural sisters, but the three words he likes. And one of them is actually peace and then grace and uh, love. He mentions these things uh, and mercy. He talks about grace, mercy, and, and peace. He repeats this in every one of his epistles. And so when people don't see this, they say, well, maybe it is not the Apostle Paul who wrote that. But there are some other internal evidences that actually can prove that it is Paul who wrote this. But what I want to talk about this morning is not necessary to prove that it is Paul who wrote this, but I want to tell you that it is a very important epistle. Amen? It's a very important letter. In fact, someone said that the epistle to the Hebrews is one of the most important books of the New Testament. In that, it contains one of the chief doctrines of the Christian faith. 
is as well a book of infinite logic and great beauty. To read it is to breathe the atmosphere of heaven itself. To study it is to partake a strong spiritual myth. To abide in its teachings is to, lead, to, to, to be led from immaturity to maturity in the knowledge of the Christian truth and of Christ himself. And it is so go to go unto perfection. Amen. He, this is a very beautiful description of the book, right? Now, the book uh, was actually written to a people called the Hebrews. Now, Hebrews, these sometimes, uh, if you go to the original language, they will say happy rules, and, uh, and the happy rules are people who are actually vagabond. I'm not sure if this is English, okay? But people who are moving here and there without actually, they don't have a home of their own. And so these are the people Paul wrote to, the people called the happy rules, Hebrews, people moving here and there who don't, and he's actually telling them some very important. Now, there were people giving up their faith. Just have to pause a little bit. When I talk about this, they were giving up their faith. And we, there's a word we use, they were backsliding. And uh, there were reasons why these people were backsliding. Now, if we're talking about Hebrews, these are the very people Jesus had come to minister unto. And he had spent years and years with them, and he preached in their synagogues, he preached in their cities, he preached from the temple court. And these are people who had heard of him, and thousands of them had actually trusted in Jesus. Amen? They had, now, now you may not understand this, but just imagine Jesus is standing here today. In front of you, forget about Fordidas, and he's the one addressing you, right? And uh, Jesus healing your sick, and uh, those of you who have deformities, problems, maybe like me or anyone else here, Jesus touches you, and you are well, amen? And then he says, come unto me, those of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And every single word was so powerful, amen? And Jesus, they trusted in him. They saw him walking out uh, hundred, several miracles, and they trusted this Jesus. And all of a sudden, they heard him probably saying, oh, do not let your heart be troubled. Because in my father's uh, house, there are many mansions, right? And if it were not so, I would have told you. And when they heard this, I believe some of them trust. They said, yes. And he said, if I, I, I am going, then I will come back and take you. Probably some of the, the ambitious people, I'm sure you know who was the most ambitious among the disciples, don't you? Probably Peter, right? Peter was one of the most ambitious and he probably said, yes. I think I'm not going to wait until Jesus comes back. I've got to go with him, and then we'll come to pick others, right? And so uh, these were excited people, hundreds, thousands of them. And now these are the very people after decades, several years later, Paul is writing to, there are people who are discouraged. Now when Jesus said, I will come back and take you, probably they thought, no one of them thought it was going to take hundreds of years. No one thought it was going to take 10 or 20, but then they saw one year passing by, two years passing by, three, four, five, and 10 and 20. And those of them who were old, they probably started dying. And those of them who, were, who had more faith, their faith started to see, is he really coming back? Or has he probably changed his mind? Or is he really coming back? And so these are the people wondering if Jesus is coming back. I'm not sure. You know what? I'm not sure if it has ever happened to me, to, to you, but it happened to me once because there was a time I was wondering if Jesus was going to come back. And, you know, when you are tempted, you have difficulties and challenges. Sometimes you start wondering, say, am I really in the right path? And why am I toiling? Why am I suffering? Is Jesus really going to come back? But on top of this, you will come to realize that there was a something very pertinent in the, ta in the life of these people. And that was the persecution. And this was a very dangerous situation. I think some of you have read, heard of the history or read of, of, of the early church. You know that from the time... Even in the year 34, a man called Stephen, he was actually stoned to death. 
And several years, all the years after him, there were persecution going on. And the Christians were being hunted out. And they were being killed on day-to-day -day basis. And especially the culmination of this persecution was during the time of Nero. Christians were being thrown to wild animals. And they were dying evil death. Some of them were burned. And this persecution was going on. And... Uh, that was a terrible situation. And so these are the people giving up their faith because of reasons. May I actually suggest this, that when somebody is giving up faith, usually when you see yourself not as a Christian as you used to be, there is always a reason. And I want to, to, to excuse, well, I don't have the way to do it, but I want to tell you that Jesus knows there is always a reason when you give up your faith, when you're no longer who you used to be in the past, there is always a reason. And sometimes we Christians, we are quick to judge and to condemn. Maybe it is because of love that has missed. You looked for love among the brethren and there was no love. And you are discouraged. Maybe you face the terrible temptations and discouraging events and moments that you felt like there was no way out. And here you are, and this is what happened to these people. And Paul, knowing what they are going through right now, he writes this epistle, amen, as a response to their difficulties. Now, when you go through the epistle itself, uh, Paul is saying, actually, from the very beginning, he's talking about Jesus. And allow me to tell you, you know, the solution to all problems is Jesus. Amen? Amen. It is Jesus. We may make announcements when people in homes as well in our personal lives. What we need, actually, is Jesus. It is not necessarily others. Those whom we think they hate us, they will probably hate us still, right? It is not necessary that children don't want to listen, those of us who have kids. It is not because the husband has a problem. It is not because the wife has a problem. It is because Jesus is not there. And so Paul recognizes the need it was Jesus. Now, he starts the book saying, no, Jesus is the son of God. Therefore, he was obedient and accepted humiliation, right, even to the cross. And so, as the son of God, he is greater than angels. And when you continue reading the epistle, he says he is not only the son of God, he has been testified to be God. Amen? For that reason, he is greater than Moses and even greater than the high priest. And in him, there is rest and there is no persistence to sin. And number three, when you come to this chapter 11 I have read, Paul is saying Jesus has been victorious. Amen? And there are people he empowered and they were victorious. And so that is why he said all these people were still living by faith when they died. Amen? But there is something that is even encouraging. Jesus has been victorious. He was victorious over death. He was victorious over sin, but he also gives the victory. I'm just as weak as anyone. A sinner saved by the grace. Amen? I know, but I know one, is, even though I'm weak, I stumble and I sometimes get discouraged. But there's one thing I determined in my life because I know who Jesus is. He was victorious over sin and death, and he gives victory, I will never be discouraged. Amen. I will move on as Jesus, as long as Jesus is still the same. And he never changes. Amen. Amen. And that is the good news for us. Jesus gives the victory. And that guarantees every one of us victory. Amen. Because Jesus gives the victory. I like what Dean said. It is not about my faithfulness. It is about Jesus' faithfulness. According to 1 John 1, 9, right? Jesus' faithfulness. Let me tell you, I've learned, I'm not probably whom I used to be in the past. There's a time I learned a very important lesson. You won't hear the lesson I learned? Well, I was younger. I wasn't married yet. My wife was, we had not yet met. It was... Long, long time ago. Not very long time ago, anyway. <laughs> 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 well, uh, I, I just remember that was the time I was, you know, coming up and I was growing and, and I felt, I think I have to get married. 
And as I thought of the, my wife, my future wife, I prayed about it. I was a preacher, by the way, at that age, I was preaching. And we were a group of young people, and we talked about this. We say, hey, how are we going to get a spouse? And uh, we were all worried. We said, no, what is happening now? You know your worries, especially young people here. <laughs> so, and then, then as, as we worried about this, we say, we prayed and prayed, and my friend said, no, I don't think these prayers are working. And he said, you know what? <laughs> And he said, I think there could be one solution because I don't know how to make a choice. And he said, well, what if you just take a pieces of papers and then manage to write the names of like 10 girls, <laughs> right? And then take these pieces of papers and just fold them and throw them up and then let them drop and then pick one. And that is the one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, I told you, I said, well, I don't think that is going to be the right wife. <laughs> The wife of a paper, yeah, I think that is not. Let's keep praying. And we kept praying and we prayed and we prayed. And my friend, one day I remember he came to me. He said, guess what? I said, so what? He said, you know what? I've got one. I said, how did you get one? I said, yes, I've got one. And he even he quickly told me the name. He said, you know, her name is so-and-so. And as he told me about the name, I felt like, oh, I was falling down. I said, what is this? Because I knew the car. And I didn't know how well she was just a terrible lady in my understanding. Because the, 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 the latest story I've, I, I had heard of her was the story. Because I used to, I worked with her in one institu in the same institution. And the story I had was that one day I met somebody coming out of her office. And he was scratching his head. I said, what is wrong with you? What is happening? He said, no, I'm angry. He said, why are you angry? I'm angry. I don't think I can hold it. He said, what do you, what do you mean? Instead of telling me what was wrong, he said, you know what? If Jesus takes that lady to heaven, let him not take me there. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> because he said, that is the I don't think I can go to heaven where that lady is going to go. In other words, he had just faced that lady in her own character. And, and he faced like, oh, no, this must be like, I don't want to go to heaven. Because she pretended to be a Christian. And so that is the picture I had. And I told my friend, I said, don't marry her. <laughs> now, I made a mistake, which I don't want you to make one day, all right? Be careful. Because sometimes if you want two enemies, then you better say that is straightforward. <laughs> and I want to testify that this guy, he wasn't kind to me. Because he went and he visited with her. And he told her, he said, guess what? Our love is ending. And the woman said, why? He said, no, finish. He said, what? For Didas told me you are bad. <laughs> and he said, you are bad. And now, now the girl, she kept quiet. She didn't. She kept quiet. But then in my innocence, I was always meeting her as a Christian. I knew she wasn't good. And I didn't know the decision the guy had taken. And that was a long time ago. The guy went to my family, and she reported. She told my family. She said, guess what? Your son is bad. He was not kind to me. Say, what? We don't know him to be bad. He said, no, he was not kind to me. So what did he do? You know what? He told my wife, my boyfriend, that I'm not good. And before, they, they were just confused. They didn't know I, was, I could say such a thing. And, uh, <laughs> and, and they, without knowing what to say, but she helped say, no, but wait. I actually know what he said is true. She said, I know it is true. I am bad. But I also want to know one thing. Jesus is good and he can change me. <laughs> I said, I learned the lesson. That actually, even though, yes, we are bad. Right now, I don't care who you are. I don't, know, I don't care your past. I don't care your weaknesses and, and, and everything that must have happened to you. What I know is that Jesus can give you victory. Amen? Amen. Doesn't matter what people are saying about you. Because Jesus has been victorious. You may complain about your weakness. But Jesus is the strongest friend. Amen. You may complain about you being a sinner, but Jesus is the greatest savior. You may complain about being sick or ill, spiritually speaking. Jesus is the greatest healer. And that is the reason why he has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. 
And so that is the lesson I learned. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this morning I want to tell you actually that you and I are living in a time such as the time of the Hebrew. It is a time such as this. Well, there was a message I preached on Friday last week, and I was trying to describe the situation. A time when the people right now where actually spirituality has no more value. I want to praise God for your presence right here. But even though we are here, it doesn't mean necessarily we are all spiritual. Probably including myself and you've got to plead for mercy. We are living in a time when uh, there was a time there was excitement about a spiritual life. And people were so excited. When you talked about mission trip, people just came and said, yes, we want to go overseas. We want to pray. But sometimes these days, even when you go, it is for tourism sometimes. Sometimes. Not our job, watch out. It's not the situation for everyone. But I'm simply saying we are living in a situation where actually uh, people uh, right now, they are Christians without being Christians. We have homes, Christian homes, which ha where there are no prayers anymore. We have churches where there are no church members and churches are closing. And yet they have the labor of being a Christian church. And you just wonder, you are wondering, we are certainly going through the time that Paul is describing in, uh, and we read this passage, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last day. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud. And you can go ahead and list abusive, disobedient to their parents. Now, Dean was, he did a good job. He prepared. He, he was saying, all right, he asked the question. And all of us were putting the hands up. And, well, that is okay. But at the same time, the gospel you and I have believed in is a powerful gospel. Amen? And it is a gospel that transforms life. We can just continue that way. We are living in a time of trouble. A time when faith is no longer faith and the truth is no longer truth. But I have a good news. I don't want to focus on these negative things. I have a good news for each one of us. You too can be victorious. Amen? You too can be victorious. There are three important lessons, and I just want to talk about these lessons before I can move on. When you go to this, uh, 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 this chapter, the way it starts, actually uh, Paul starts talking about faith, and he mentions a number of heroes of faith. He talks about Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses. He talks about all these people who lived by faith in Jesus, and he enabled them to die. And then he said all these people were still living by faith when they died. Amen? They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. So what is the first thing? How did they be victorious? They all died by faith. It is okay to have faith at, this be at the beginning, but it is even much, much better to have faith at the end. They all died. So what was the characteristic of these people? Something that actually helped them to die in faith. Well, you can realize when you look at this passage, you will realize that uh, from verse 13, that these people were living, they were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. No, they were just still waiting. But they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens. They were strangers. And I guess the very first characteristic that helped these people to be able to be victorious is that they recognized their identity. They knew who they were. Amen? Amen. By the way, identity is something very important. When you know who you are, it determines the way you walk. Amen? When you know who you are, it determines even the way you eat. It determines the people you talk to. It determines the places you go to and the places you don't go to. It determines the kind of behavior you have because you know who you are. It's interesting. They may tell you you are the president the next day. Well, I'm... I'm, I'm I don't know exactly what, 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 what went on. But they may tell you are the president next day, and you are saying, yes, yes, no more smoking. I think because I am somebody. And these people, they knew they were aliens. Amen? And so this made them become who they were. 
Now, there are three important words. Maybe before I de uh, talking about this being a lion, uh, there are three important words. You know, uh, he said they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them. First word is saw. Welcomed them. They welcomed. And uh, admitted. These three key, key words are very important to understand what actually happened in the lives of these people. These people saw. And once they saw, they welcomed. And after welcoming, they knew who they were. Amen? Now, let me tell you, we've got Christians, we've got people in our families, in our society today, who actually want to know who they are without even seeing. There's always a need to see, and once you have seen, and what are you supposed to see? You've got to see, you know, Paul saw, by the way, there was a time Paul said, well, I know somebody who went to the third heaven, amen? And that's, I don't know if he was in the spirit or, or in the body, but he saw, and I guess Paul was talking about himself, and so they said, they saw, and once they saw, wow, they were excited, and they said, they welcomed now, there's a word that is used there. It is aspasomai. They actually greet it, right? They are greeting. They say, yes, wow. And then after greeting, they say, they recognize, yes, we don't want to be here. This is not our home. We know we are strangers. Amen? Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, how I wish all of us would see who Jesus is. How I wish all of us would not just hear about Jesus, whom is being talked about right from the pulpit. How I wish every woman, every man who is right here, every one of us, because the problem we have is actually that we have not seen. Because if you only have a chance to see, if we only have a chance to know what is right there, what Jesus, you know, a ways to, to give us, then we will have no problem once we make that first step of seeing. Then we will welcome him. And once we welcome him, we will definitely know that we don't want to be here. We want to meet the Lord. Amen? Amen. So the problem is seeing. The problem is seeing. And once we see, there's going to be another, an, an, another step. After we have seen, we will definitely uh, welcome. And after we have welcomed, we will actually uh, be able to recognize who you are. So when you see somebody who doesn't love Jesus or who does not live according to a Christian life, it is actually because he has not seen. And so you shouldn't blame him. You probably need to show him. And when you see yourself as, what is your response to Jesus? No, you can't respond until you have seen. When you manage to see, then you can, risk. in other words, you can measure your relationship with Jesus by what happened before. Have you seen something? If you haven't, then we shouldn't blame you and you shouldn't blame yourself. I shouldn't blame myself. There's this illustration. There is this young, uh, 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 a young boy. I, I don't know the source, okay? You don't have to ask for the source. It's an illustration. But it happened. It, was, it happened in Russia during the communist rule when uh, uh, the communist rule was saying, well, remember, they actually said there's no God. God just died. And uh, some philosophers said they killed him. And, 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 and there's no Jesus, no God. And they could take people into the stadium and tell them, and say, listen, there is no God. And, you know, you've got these powerful speakers that even when he's talking about falsehood, you just are puzzled. You don't know how to react. And so they were talking to thousands and thousands and pastors and priests were there and deacons and deaconesses and all these religious people with their ties and, and they're just pastors. So what, is, what are we going to do about this situation? Look at what he's saying. He's saying there's no God. And then he said, hey, is there anyone who can actually challenge me now? And pastors probably looked at elders and elders looked at deacons and deacons said, no, what are we going to do? How can we prove that Jesus is there? And guess what? A time came, there was a young boy. You know what? Loving Jesus doesn't have anything to do with the role you occupy in the church, right? It just has something to do whether you have met Jesus, amen? And so this young boy, when he looked around and he saw there was nobody responding, he said, I've got to, move, to make a move. And he moved. He didn't know what to say exactly, but he came right to the front. He said, no, this must be crazy. I don't think he's the one to challenge the speaker. And as he came, he had his back. He, uh, before he got the microphone and I was going to speak, he just oh, couldn't help because he was very hungry. And he remembered that he had some something very interesting. He had a banana with him. And he reached out his banana. 
Now, I'm not going to eat this banana, all right? <laughs> so he peeled the banana, and after peeling the banana, then he started eating. And as people were probably hungry, they looked and said, no, no, he must be crazy. You get him up to the... He, I don't think he's going to say something. Look, he's crazy. And he said, no, wait a minute. I have to say something. And he was eating the banana, and then an idea came to his mind. And he said, guess what? He talked to the guy. He said, hey, did you test, did you feel how this banana is good? And the guy said, but I didn't eat the banana. How, how can I know it is good? You crazy. And he said, exactly, that is the reality that is there. The Bible says, actually, that test and know how good the Lord is. Amen? And if you have not tested, you will never know how good the Lord is. And I want to challenge every one of us. I've served this God for a number of years and as some of you have served God for probably much more than and all those who have met Jesus from the very beginning we know that he can never disappoint you and once you've met him then definitely we welcome him and you know that your life right here is a transition ladies and gentlemen to see Paul had had a chance he had had a chance to see and to test. And after testing who Jesus was, look at what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 8. He said, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, and I consider them rubbish. Now, this is a very powerful thing. Imagine Paul, after seeing Jesus and knowing, remember, this was the guy who actually was persecuting the church. Now a time comes, he say, no. Whatever was a profit to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything. In other words, everything. Titles, money, position in life, friendship, whatever he used to value in life. And nothing is worthy the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, he probably doesn't know how to express this. But he said everything, literally everything. Once you meet Jesus, let me tell you, Jesus is the sweetest friend ever. Amen. He is the greatest friend you can ever meet in life. You just need to taste and see. And how do you taste? You've got to read the Bible. You've got to pray. You've got to just Seek a relationship with this Jesus, and you will see the difference. Ladies and gentlemen, you will see the difference. And then later on he said, but our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, I believe the people Paul was writing to, they understood what being an alien meant, what actually being a stranger meant, because he was writing to the Hebrew. These are the people who had been moving Throughout the countries, you know, the uh, Jewish people, they had been colonized or, or deported into captivity several times. They went to Babylon, right? And Babylon was replaced by the Middle Persian. And the Middle Persian was replaced by the Greeks. And the Greeks were replaced by the Romans. When they were in Babylon, you remember one time, they knew exactly not being home what it meant. When they were in Rome, you remember one time, they were even asked to sing a song according to Psalms 137. They were asked to sing a song, and they said no. When we were asked to sing a song, we hung our harps, instruments, we just hung them because we didn't want to sing this song in a foreign land. They longed for a country. And now, even when they were in their own country, they realized that this country is not the best because right now, they were under the Roman dominion being in their own land that is so ridiculous i mean you are in your own country you are supposed to be free and there is another country that's now you may not understand exactly what was happening with the Rom roman actually uh, uh dominion it was a terrible situation there is a saying in french we say that uh, if somebody is gonna treat you in a very bad way he will say je vais te traiter comme un esclave romain now i don't i have to translate that i'm gonna treat you like a, a, a roman slave so that is how Romans used to treat people. So these are people who are actually persecuted in their own land. And so they know when Paul says no, all these people who lived before you, they were actually still living by faith when they died because they saw, they welcomed, and they knew that they were strangers on earth. They knew that they were strangers on earth. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the next criteria that you can see with these people is what we have on verse 15. It says, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. And instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. He had prepared the city for them. Now, these are people. He said, no, wait. If they had longing for a country where they came from. Now, uh, somehow, he's also referring to Abraham and all these people who left their home, going to a promised land. But in a spiritual way, he's talking about to people who died even before, after, before Abraham and after Abraham. And say, no. They forgot their past life. You can actually, you know, let me tell you, there is a connection. It is always said, and this is commonly believed, that there is a connection between behavior there is a co and, and, and the thoughts and the emotions. In other words, what we do will have an implication on our thoughts, and our thoughts will have implications on our, our emotions, and of course, vice versa. Now, also you can say emotions will have something to do with the thoughts, and, and so on and so forth. Now, what they did for them to be able to actually know that they are strangers, they were totally disconnected from the past. How often have we accepted Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior? Maybe in our young age. Maybe sometime when the word of God was preached. And then a time came when we found ourselves right down again. Then up, then down, then up, then down. And all the time, yes, the word of God is preached. And I feel like I should give my life to Jesus. But allow me to tell you, the reason is that oftentimes we are not totally disconnected from the past. In other words, we've got to forget Forget what past, forget the life we used to have, and we got to make, you know, there are things we used to do, we used to do something different. Maybe you used not to come to church. If you want any change, make sure you come to church. You used not to read the Bible. If you want any change, make sure you read the Bible. You used to have friends who took you to a place where you didn't want to go. If you want any change, make sure you change those friends. And that is the only condition. You've got to live and forget totally what actually happened. Abraham, when he came out of Ur, what did he say? He told his servant when he was going to look for the spouse for his son. He said, make sure, do not, you do not take my son back there. That is Abraham speaking. If the girl doesn't want to follow you, just leave it. Then you will not be under off. But make sure you don't take. They forgot totally where they had come from. And that is how the really connection with Jesus is done. You used to have friends. You used to have thoughts. You've got to be disconnected totally. And this is what Paul said as well. Paul used to be somebody different. And he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 through 14, what did he say? He said, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining to training to what, what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. In other words, the past may not be good. It is so bad that all of us have a past. And when we look back, we realize that, that that past is so dark that sometimes I don't even want to look what is happening. But we end up just going back again. Yeah, going. Back. But Paul says, no, there is one thing I do. I know that past is there. I know there is the life I lived, which I didn't actually enjoy. I know there are all those scars of the past. But there is one thing I do. I prefer to ignore them and look ahead. Amen? I do not cons myself to have hold reach of it. But one thing I do, I forget what is behind. And it's Training to what was ahead, I press on. Amen? Amen. Move on. Forget about what happened because the past Jesus will deal with it. What you've got to deal with is the future. And the Bible says all these people were still living by faith when they died. All these people were still living by faith when they died. All these people were still living faith by faith when they died. Now, why did they use the word they were still living? Maybe they would have said, well, all these people lived by faith when they died. But Paul said they were still living by faith when they died. What does it actually imply? Still living by faith. That means there was a beginning, there was a continuity, and then the end comes. And this is the problem of spiritual life. 
out of experience, I've preached to thousands of people in my humble ability that the Lord has given me. And I've seen hundreds of people giving their lives to Jesus. And then just two weeks later, or three or four weeks after I went back to the place, and then I say, hey, how many were there last time when I preached? And I realize there is probably just one. Or there are two, or there are three. So what happened? It is easy to start. It is easy actually to start this spiritual journey. Uh, once upon a time, come to we, my church, and say, yes, they say amen. You also say amen. They decide to follow Jesus. You say, yes, I decide to follow Jesus. But that is not enough. Paul is saying, no, yes, starting is important, but finishing the race is more important. Amen? So you've got to end the race. Be determined to finish. This is the secret for you to win the victory. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you one thing I think of. You know, uh, well, we have been preaching, and uh, I, I was just born recently. Amen? There are preachers who came before me. And there are preachers who came before you. And they preached, and they preached, and they preached. And so you wonder sometimes, and you've heard so many. If you have not preached, you've heard so many preaching. And sometimes you wonder, so there's going to be preaching, and then preaching, and preaching, and preaching, and preaching, and then repenting, and repenting. No, but interestingly, it's probably not going to be that way. There is a beginning, there is an end. This is what Paul is saying. They were still living by faith when they died. And the end may not be necessary, the death. By the way, may God bless you, amen. There is no one here who is supposed to die before Jesus comes, amen. But unfortunately, it happens. And if it doesn't happen, Jesus will come. Everything has a beginning and it has an end. We're not going to preach and preach and preach. And then they preach and for Jesus puts their hand. No, there is going to be a begin. There is a beginning. There is going to be an end. And so, if I have to win the victory, then I have to hold on, amen. Because I know the time is going to come. I use, you know, I love so many games, but there is one actually I used to love so much, and you probably you will be amazed because you don't have it here, and uh, I don't love it anymore. That is. Uh, he talked about, was it, did he talk about soccer? Well, in this part of the world, you don't know soccer, so yeah, anyway, <laughs> you don't, because, because in other countries, when there is a World Cup, people will not sleep. He knows what I'm talking about. They will not sleep in everywhere now, uh, uh, because since I hated it, since I hated it, I don't know what is going on. Even when my own country is playing, I don't care. And how did I come to hate it? There was a reason. Because I used to play, and I was a good player. And I played. And then the time came finally where I realized that a guy was going to score. And I ran after him. And I was a good runner. And so just, and he was faster than me. So the only way was actually going to just make him fall. And I said, I was a Christian. I said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I say, I'm not going to make somebody fall just because of the goal. Let him score. And uh, now one of my, two, my teammates saw me, and he was angry at me. And he turned back and he said, if you are bringing God in the, 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 in, in the soccer field, you go out of the... Now, I don't know how he knew I was bringing God in the soccer field. <laughs> But I told him quickly, I said, listen, if I have to forget God because I've come to the soccer field, then I will never come back here again. And uh, he wasn't happy, but I stopped playing from that time. I stopped. Now I can play maybe for fun, but not in competition as they used to do. Because I don't want to make anyone for, just forget God because I'm playing. And so let me tell you, one reality is, anyway, one reality is, soccer taught me something. People are so anxious. You know, there is a game going on. There are onlookers. There are players on both sides. These are excited. These are excited. Yes, who is going to win? Who is going to win? Who is going to win? And sometimes you realize there are four scores out zero, and you are wondering, are they going to make it? No, it is impossible. But even at the last minute, there is a time they make it, and you realize they strain, and they score one, and second, and two, and three, and finally, there is the loser, and there is the winner. At the end, there is always the last whistle, and you can see that some are so discouraged. Others are just excited because there is a victory. They have won the battle. They have come to the end. In other words, the beginning is important. The middle is important. The process is important, but the end is important. My, and my appeal to you this 
afternoon. Is that God helps you and God helps me because there is a time this end is going to come. And the most important thing is not yet you accept Jesus as Lord and, and Savior today. There are so many who accepted this faith, faith before and they have given up their faith. There are so many who started this journey and some of them, you know them. And right now when you look for them, you don't see them because they have just slow by slow something happened. And so Word of God is very clear about this. When you go to the book of Revelation, Jesus says, he said to me, this is John saying, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Jesus is saying, yes, I was there at the beginning. I am right there. I am the one who came and died for you, and I gave my life for you, and I am still there with you. But I want you to know that actually the overcomer, the one who is going to win the final victory, this is going to be my son. This is going to be my daughter. And I want to challenge you this morning that the Lord will help you and will help me to realize this cost paid for you and me and to be able to hold unto this hand. Hold unto Jesus and say, Lord, I give my life to you. And I am determined to, I know actually who I am because I have tested. Start testing Jesus right now and know that I have tested. I know who you are. I know who, that you're coming soon. And I know, Father, that I should not look back because back it is not a good life. I want to focus ahead of me. I want to be determined to finish the race. And I know you will enable me. If you are saying this, if that is your prayer, if you are saying, Lord, help me right now. I need to know who I am. And I need to be determined to finish. If you are saying this, wherever you are, who are whoever you are, I want to say a prayer for you. Would you like to put your hand with me? If you are determined to win this victory, may God bless you. May God bless you. And I want to kneel down, please, so that we can say a word of prayer. Lord in heaven, this is a very important hour. This is one of the most important hours we have had ever in our lives. We are renewing our relationship with you. Some of us are starting our relationship with you. We are committing ourselves unto you. And so, Father, we know who we are. We know that we have not been good, but we just rely on the mercy and love of Jesus. We know that no matter how sinful we are, you are a forgiving Lord. May you forgive us our sins. I want to pray for every one of us whose heart is contrite and humble before you, whether they are knelt down or they are still seated, but they are thinking about their lives. May you, Father, I pray as you have answered my prayers. I pray for somebody. May you touch him. May you touch her. May you help somebody right here. Feel your presence and your power energizing him and empowering him to be able to move on. Help us to know that we are strangers on this earth and that a time is going to come when we'll be in heaven with you. Help us to be able to determine not to look back. Help us to be able to decide, Father, to finish the race. I pray for each one of us. There are those of us who are going to be baptized in the afternoon. I pray that if there is anyone else who feels like he's compelled by your Holy Spirit, there's nothing to wait for, nothing to wait for. The time is now. Let them be able to make a decision. May you bless each one of us and dismiss us with your love and continue to be with us even with the rest of the programs. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.